This is our third podcast in the GI series, and this podcast will deal with the organs of the small intestine, so we'll be looking at the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Recall that the general organization of the GI tract, the mucosa, here I've just drawn, just diagrammatically, just to try and highlight as an epithelium, the lamina propria, connective tissue, blood vessels, lymphatics, muscularis mucosa. I've tried to highlight the two layers of smooth muscle, inner circular, outer longitudinal layers of smooth muscle, submucosa, layer of connective tissue, muscularis externa, with its smooth muscle layers, and the serosa or adventitia. So now let's look at the small intestine. The small intestine is a thin walled tube. We can think of it as three regions, or you can think of it as three distinct organs if you want. The duodenum, which has submucosal glands or Brunner's glands, the jejunum, and the ileum. Ilium has structures called pyres patches, which are distinct lymphatic nodules. I want to stress that lymphatic nodules can be found throughout the GI tract, but there are very large concentrations of these nodules in the ilium, and within the ilium these nodules are known as pyres patches. The small intestine, of course, functions in digestion and absorption. The mucosal surface of the small intestine is increased by several means, the plica circularis, the villi, and the microvilli. And then there are some very discrete structures in the mucosa of the small intestine called the crypts of Libricum. These are basically the glands, and we'll show you those. The surface for the small intestine is increased approximately 500-fold over that of a simple tube. Remember in the stomach we had the rugae, which increased the surface of the stomach something like three times that of a simple tube. The surface in the small intestine something like 500 times that of a simple tube. Uh, and we can kind of follow it by this diagram. If you take the plica circularis, which is an infolding of the mucosa and the submucosa, that that increases surface area something like three times that of a simple tube, much like the rugae of the stomach. But then the mucosa itself is, fo is folded into villi, and those folded villi increase the surface area something like an additional eight times. And then off of each absorptive cell in the small intestine, there are microvilli, and those microvilli increase the surface something like 20 times over that of a simple tube. So if you were to take this and multiply 20 times eight times and three times, well, that's almost 500 times. It's 480 times that of a simple tube. Diagrammatically here, this is the villus folding into the lumen. So this would be lumen, villus folding in. Here's the gland or the crypt, the crypt of Libricum. And uh, I also like to make the point here, we have the microvilli, these elaborate foldings on the apical boundary of each of the intestinal absorptive cells, adsorbed onto that epithelial surface is the glycocalyx. This highlights what I've just told you, the plica circularis, or folds of the mucosa and the submucosa. The plica circularis is also given the name valve of Kirkring. You can see the crypts of Libricum, you can see the villi, you can see the microvilli, and you can see the adsorbed glycocalyx. The villus is just the mucosa, and that would consist of the epithelium, the microvilli, and the glycocalyx. The lamina propria, the capillaries in the small intestine, you'll often find in the lamina propria lacteals, which are specialized lymphatic capillaries that function to transport chylomicrons back to the liver. There are numerous lymphocytes, plasma cells, macrophages, mast cells, eosinophils, typical connective tissue cells in the lamina propria. And then, of course, the muscularis mucosae, always inner circular and always outer longitudinal. And this is just a nice view of the small intestine here on the left, showing the plica circularis. So here we've got the muscularis externa. Here is submucosa. Look at the submucosa folding in with the mucosa into this plica. Off of the plica, you can see the villi folding into the lumen. So all of this is lumen. Here is lumen as well.
And then here is the higher power view of one of these villi, and you can see the simple columnar epithelium. Look at the occasional goblet cells. Here is one of these distended lacteals, and we'll talk about these lacteals in just a few minutes. At this high power, you can get a sense of the brush border on the intestinal epithelial cells. Remember, these are the apical boundaries of the membrane folded into these elaborate microvilli to increase surface area. Much like we showed you before, just a diagrammatic representation of the mucosa in the small intestine. So here would be the villi that are folding in to the small intestine. Here would be one of the pits of the crypts of Libricum. Here is a lacteal in the middle of one of these villi. And then you can see a variety of cell types that line the mucosa here. So you've got a surface absorptive cell, goblet cells, entroendocrine cells, regenerative cells, and paneth cells. And we'll go through each of these in just a minute. Remember the stomach lacks villi. So here the mucosal surface of the stomach, here the mucosal surface of the stomach like this. Here the mucosal surface and notice the folds projecting into the lumen. Something I'm going to stress to you in the laboratory is an easy way to help you differentiate the small intestine from the stomach is draw an imaginary line, if you will, at the luminal surface in the small intestine. I'm doing that like so. And you've got these villi that are projecting into the lumen. If I go back a slide and I do that on the stomach, yeah, to be sure, I've got these rugae, these folds, but look at this imaginary line. There isn't anything projecting above that imaginary line into the lumen of the stomach as there is in the small intestine. So if we look at the cells of the small intestine, the surface absorptive cell, also called an enterocyte, these have prominent apical microvilli and a glycocalyx. These cells are rich in transport and digestive enzymes. They have a well-developed rough and smooth ER and Golgi complex. The smooth ER is, of course, for lipid resynthesis and chylomicron production. The rough ER and Golgi are for chylomicron assembly and release. Goblet cells, these cells are continuously secreting a protective mucus that sits on the surface of the epithelium. The stem cell or generative cell, these are deep in the crypts of Libricum. They're not at the absolute base of the crypt, though. These cells are mitotically active. And I'd like to make a point that most GI epithelial cells turn over in two to four days. So these are a rapidly renewing cell population with a relatively fast cell cycle time. The paneth cells are at the absolute base of the crypts of Libricum in the small intestine. You see paneth cells in the appendix in humans, but interestingly you don't see paneth cells in the large intestine. These are typical zymogen secreting cells with a basal rough ER and Golgi and apical secretory granules. These cells secrete lysozyme and alpha defensins. The alpha defensins stimulate cytotoxic T cells. The lysozyme itself is an antibacterial substance. And then the entroendocrine cells, which just like in the stomach, secrete a variety of endocrine products. A specialized cell, which I don't show in this diagram, called an M cell or a microfold cell. This is a modified epithelial cell. It's in the mucosa over where there are abundant lymph nodules. And these M cells function as antigen presenting or antigen processing cells in the GI tract. And this shows an example of what the M cell might look like. Here are the typical enterocytes, the absorptive cells. And here's one of these M cells. And just showing, for example, some bacteria in the lumen of the GI tract. This, these bacteria may be phagocytized by the M cells and then brought across the surface and presented to antigen presenting cells in the lamina propria. And these will then stimulate T helper cells, which will stimulate the B cells to produce antibodies. And of course, you know that antibodies are very important for the function, the immunologic protection in the GI tract. Antibodies 
antibodies can get to the GI tract from several areas, obviously from the lymph nodes. They will circulate through the lymphatic system, through the blood system, and get into the GI tract. Plasma cells in the lymphatic nodules in the GI tract will synthesize IgA. These will be transcytosed across the epithelial cells into the lumen of the GI tract. And of course, immunoglobulin can be recycled as bile is recycled through the, from the liver back into the GI tract. This is just to put some of the histology into perspective with some of the physiology that you'll be learning. And it deals with how the absorptive cells in the small intestine deal with lipids. So, for example, lipids would be in the lumen of the small intestine. They'll be broken down by digestive enzymes, let's say pancreatic lipases that will be secreted. They'll be broken down to fatty acids and monoglycerides. You'll remember from biochemistry that monoglycerides and fatty fatty acids will be emulsified by bile. These will form my cells that can move into the surface absorptive cells. Glycerol, of course, will diffuse directly into the surface absorptive cell. The monoglycerides and fatty acids will be esterified into dry glycerides within the smooth ER. The triglycerides will be complex with protein within the Golgi apparatus. These will form chylomicrons, which are going to be released into the lacteals. These chylomicrons will be transported by the lymphatics because the lacteals are actually lymphatic capillaries. The chylomicrons will be transported then by the lymphatics to the liver. And then molecules like glycerol and short and medium chained fatty acids will be absorbed directly into the bloodstream from the absorptive cells. Just a very low power view of the small intestine, and I hope that at this point you would begin to realize that it's the duodenum because you can see the submucosal glands here. The very first thing I look for is the muscularis mucosi. I see that here. So if I see the muscularis mucosi, I automatically know where the submucosa is. And if I see submucosal glands and see the submucosal glands in a tubular organ where the mucosa is not a stratified squamous epithelium, then I know absolutely that I am in the duodenum, the small intestine with the villi, the mucosa folding into these villi, I know I'm in the duodenum. Draw this imaginary line across the luminal surface, like so, and so I look at all these villi that are projecting into the lumen. That tells me I'm in the small intestine as opposed to the large intestine where there are no villi projecting into the lumen, and of course there are no villi projecting into the lumen in the stomach. Uh, here I can see lamina propria, so mucosa, epithelium, lamina propria, muscularis mucosi, submucosa, layer of connective tissue with blood vessels, lymphatics, there would be nerve fibers in here, but I don't see any at this magnification, and the abundant submucosal glands, and then muscularis externa, inner circular outer longitudinal layer. I wouldn't expect you to pick this out at this low power magnification, but here is a myenteric plexus between the inner circular and outer longitudinal layer of the smooth muscle. I do want to make the point these submucosal glands secrete an alkaline rich fluid, so they are very important for protection against the stomach acid that is going to be coming in with the chyme. The secretion also inhibits the secretion of stomach acids. It secretes epidermal growth factor as well to stimulate cell division because remember GI epithelial cells turn over very rapidly. On the right is a PAS stain preparation of the same type of image shown on the left. And the image on the left is pretty much the image I just showed you on the last slide. This PAS stained image is showing the carbohydrate-rich secretion of the Brunner's glands here and showing the very carbohydrate-rich secretion of the goblet cells in the crypts of Libricum and the goblet cells lining the mucosal surfaces. Look at the goblet cells here. So here you'd expect the goblet cells to be staining positive with PAS. And then, of course, the glycocalyx itself is PAS positive. Just a higher power view. A very nice PAS stained view showing the very nice 
intense staining of the goblet cells, and here showing the lumen with the glycocalyx stained. Here I've got profiles of the lamina propria. This is a cross section of one of the glands, so these would be, this would be part of the crypt. And so right here, this space is the luminal space. That space is the same as this space, as luminal space. Here, again, one of the glands in a little more longitudinal section. Right here, actually, is luminal space. Luminal space. Luminal space. This is a very nice stained view. I'm at the bases of the crypts of Libricum, and I can see the Paneth cells staining here. I can kind of outline one like this. Maybe outline another one like this. You can outline several like this, but it's very clear you can see these granules. These granules would be the granules that are rich in lysozyme. These granules are being held until the cells receive a signal for secretion. Here is an iron hematoxylin stain. I don't expect you to know that stain, but it's specifically picking out these Peneth cells near the bases of the crypts of Libricum. A nice villus projecting into the lumen. So here would be the lumen itself. Here you can see some goblet cells. A little bit of muscularis mucosi. A higher power view near the bases of the crypts of Libricum. So here would be the lumen. Here would be the Paneth cells. I can trace one like this. I'll trace another one like this. Probably a third one here. Maybe a fourth one like that. And perhaps a fifth one in profile like that. I think I can see the nucleus for this cell and maybe I'm seeing a profile of the nucleus for that cell. So these are at the bases of the crypts. I go a little bit higher above the Paneth cells and these are mitotic figures. This is probably a metaphase and another metaphase. So mitotic figures. Here probably a cell just entering late anaphase or telophase. So mitotic figures near the bases of these glands. Here I'm in the ileum. Look at this very elaborate lymphatic nodule or Peyer's patch. Look, you can see the clear germinal center. This is probably muscularis mucosi. This large lymphatic nodule is actually broken through the muscularis mucosi, and so it, much of it is sitting in the lamina propria. There's lots of diffuse lymphatic tissue as well. And a general rule of thumb, as you move from the duodenum through the jejunum to the ileum, the amount of lymphatic tissue increases as you move distally through the small intestine. Higher power view in the small intestine showing bases of the crypts of Libricum, so lamina propria like so. This would be the epithelium. Here I've got the pointer in some of the luminal surface, muscularis mucosi, inner circular, outer longitudinal. Submucosa is a submucosal plexus, also called the Meissner's plexus. Look at the profiles of blood vessels, muscularis externa, inner circular, outer longitudinal. And look at the myenteric or arbax plexus. Now, let me make an important point for you. When you see the muscle layers like this, this view where you see this inner layer as an inner circular layer of muscle, where the muscle looks like it's running longitudinally across the plane of section, that's implying that the profile has been actually cut or the tube is cut in a cross-sectional profile. So the inner layer of smooth muscle looks like it's running around that tube and the outer longitudinal layer looks like it's running outright at you. Be careful. This is always the orientation of smooth muscle. Always in a circular, always outer longitudinal. If I had a longitudinal section through the GI tract, these muscle layers would appear to be flipped. So it would look like this inner layer would be running out at you, and this outer layer would look like it's wrapping around in a circle. By definition, it is still inner circular, outer longitudinal, but the plane of section is different. We are liable to ask you that on a practical exam, so you want to be careful of that. Always inner circular, always outer longitudinal for the 
muscularis externa and the muscularis mucosi recapitulates that same layering always inner circular always outer longitudinal here 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 some mitotic figures higher power view the submucosal plexus shown here and the myenteric plexus shown here inner circular layer of the muscularis externa outer longitudinal layer the serosal surface like so look at the large neurons and look at the neuron itself the cell body look at the nucleus look at the nucleolus oftentimes in the muscularis externa you'll see these myenteric plexus running almost all the way around the cross-sectional profile of the tube some regional differences in the small intestine with respect to lymphoid tissue the lymphoid tissue increases from the duodenum to the ileum in the ileum the lymphoid tissue is specifically identified as pyres patches the number of goblet cells tends to increase in number from the duodenum to the ileum bile salt absorption increases from the duodenum to the ileum vitamin absorption increases from the duodenum to the ileum lipid absorption decreases from the duodenum to the ileum most of the lipids are absorbed in the duodenum that's where there's the abundance of the lacteals submucosal glands are only found in the duodenum that is an absolute diagnostic feature to identify the duodenum the shape of the villi is not so useful histologically in the duodenum the villi are somewhat leaf shaped in the jejunum they're club shaped in the ileum they're more finger shaped what will i expect you to be able to identify on a practical exam with respect to the small intestine i will always expect you to identify the duodenum because you should be able to pick out the submucosal glands if we have the small intestine and it does not have the submucosal glands i will accept either jejunum or ileum for an answer unless the small intestine has on the same slide a piece of the large intestine then you would have to say it's the ileum because the ileum would be that part of the small intestine that would run right into the large intestine i hope that makes sense i think as you go through the laboratory you'll appreciate that in the next podcast, we'll conclude our series on the GI system by looking at the large intestine and the appendix.